Alan another praise Lord. It's this last Sunday, at least for a while. Hey, Amen. Do we drag him back in here someday? <laughs> Amen. Love you, buddy. Your blessing. By the way, I don't know if they're here today, but I was working on two bass players that came to our men's conference. <laughs> so be, be praying. One of them said, I need to find church home, so hallelujah. We're in a series called No Turning Back. And by the way, we just had the most no turning back conference with our men. It was just unimaginable. It really was imaginable because uh, I guess about six months ago, we met with the men and had a dinner and we talked about the vision and the task that was before us and what we wanted to do and why we were going to do this versus a retreat this year and uh, what the expectations were. And I said, you know, guys, in my heart, I see it already. I said, I can see, you know, a couple of hundred men in this room, you know, worshiping God together, praising God at the top of their lungs, singing along in worship and adoration. I said, I can see the altar, you know, right now my heart and mind filled so there's going to be guys on their knees, some broken, some weeping, others getting right with God, men getting saved, people getting their hearts and their homes right. Boy, I tell you, Saturday morning, there was a fulfillment of that vision. I mean, all through the service, it was just great. But Saturday morning, I, I'm trying to give the invitation, and people are coming forward before I can get started with the invitation, you know. It's kind of, come on, guys, hold on. We haven't done the invitation yet, and you're already coming forward. So. It was a phenomenal time with the Lord. I mean, Neil Jeffrey, Malcolm Ellis, uh, Jeff Bimbert. It was just, it was a great, great time of worship and adoration and firing up the engines. Uh, if you were here, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, this message series really goes hand in hand with kind of moves right from the conference to where we are and uh, the context of once we make our decisions and our commitments, as, uh, as, uh, as, as our quarterback speaker said, you know, we, we make a play. You know, it's time to make a play. That uh, this is how to make the play. This is, you know, to move forward. And we, we talk about in Second Peter chapter 1, where we'll be looking at the scriptures in a moment about uh, moving forward with our decisions and our commitments. It's not, you know, the stopping point is not coming to the altar. That's the starting point. That's where we move out. That's where the difference is made. But, you know, I think there's just times and seasons we need things like that. At least I do in my spiritual life, just to other brothers, other speakers, other preachers, you know, people coming in. But the, I guess the more, most phenomenal part, normally we would take 65, 70 guys to a conference. On the other hand, we, with, our, with our conference here, not going off in a retreat format, we had almost 200 guys. The goal was to do exactly what we did. And I think you men see what can be done when we set our hearts and minds to do it. I know some people looked at me like I was out of my mind and said, we need to have at least a couple hundred men here, you know, and... Uh, that is that a possibility to take our guys, our little core group, and get that many men together? You guys did such a phenomenal, I mean, I can't pat you on the back enough or inviting. And those two guys you invited that didn't come, God honored that anyway, amen? But you did what God told you to do and what you were led to do of the Holy Spirit and what you caught the vision of the church to do and your pastors to do and the elders to do, and you followed through with that. And it was such a phenomenal thing to see God honor what you did. And I'm here to pat you on the back and say, let, praise God for you, you know. you done, you done good, Jimmy and his team. You guys did a phenomenal job, you know. And everybody involved, I mean, the ladies that came in to help, I can't say thank you enough. It was just a great and glorious, fresh time of vision and revelation again to, to get a hold of it. So I'm really trusting that God will carry that through in your hearts and your lives and that even into your homes they sense that renewed spirit. But it was a great, great time. So let's give the Lord another praise offering for that. Hallelujah. It, it, it was glorious to be a part of that and to see what the Lord was doing. In 2 Peter, we started this message series last week, uh, and, and it was titled, we said, No Turning Back. And it's the, it's the key to finishing well and getting on down the road. You know, there is a day that we're all going to stand before the, what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you're a believer, you're going to be at that, that location one day, all right? That, you're, we're all headed to that spot. We're all moving to, to, to the life that's here after the eternal life. I did a sermon a, a week ago in, in this building, and I talked about, people talk about our, when we lose people, they say, well, I guess they've left the land of the living. You know, no, this is not the land of the living. This is the land of the dying. We're moving to the land of the living, all right? That's where life is. It's what's before us. It's being with Jesus. It's seeing his face, beholding the glory of God. But as we, as we move out of this life, the Bible tells us that every believer is going to have to come to the Bema seat. It's, it's a Greek word, and it was a place, the Bema seat in the Greek culture was a place where there would be awards awarded out, the trophies for winning the races. 
And the Bible says we're going to receive our rewards there or we're not going to receive our rewards there, depending on how we lived our lives presently. So the idea we get in Scripture is, praise God, it's great to be saved, but that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's not where we stop. That's where we start. And so Peter's writing the church saying, hey, you have this, you've discovered what it means to know Jesus. You've understood the, the, the knowledge, the true knowledge of knowing Christ. And he moves forward from this point. And let's just look at these verses we started with last week. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. In other words, you've come to Christ. You know what it really means to know Jesus now. You've been called to this life and grace and peace are now being given to you, not just in a kind of singular format. They're being multiplied to you and poured out of you. And he says, by this glory and by this excellence and by this true knowledge, he goes on to say in the next verses, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world by lust. Now, for this very reason, what reason? You got this glory, you got this virtue, all that grace is being multiplied to you. You have the knowledge, the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. You've got the presence of the Holy Spirit. You got all this grace. Now you know Jesus truly is your Lord and Savior. All right, for this reason, apply all diligence in your faith, supply virtue, moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in that brotherly kindness, love. Now catch this verse. If these qualities, these seven things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren and sisters, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. What's he saying? You're going to have grace for the race. You're going to have what you need to get you all the way to the end. You're going to have this abundance of God's grace supplied to you in an abundant way so you, you'll make it in glorious fashion into heaven. Now, as we talked about last week, we kind of built on those first three or four or five verses where he talks about if these qualities, if these things, if these abound in you, then they shall make you whether you're neither, uh, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he uses that terminology about the true knowledge a couple of times because I think he wants you to make it clear that you do need to make your calling and election sure. The foundation for all this is you truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You got to get there. If you, if you bypass this, we'll talk about it in a moment, you're not headed for a good place. And a lot of people literally try to bypass that experience of rebirth because they know there's a commitment involved. Because they know there's, it, you're coming to the cross. And that's where we died our old self. So he's, really, he's very seriously impacting this important part about true knowledge of Jesus. True knowledge of Jesus. You're calling your election. Make sure that you know that you know that you know you belong to Jesus. Are you a child of God? Settle that issue right now. Get that up front. And then I'm going to tell you, he says after that, here's how you can not be useless and unfruitful and barren. I, you know, I, I'm trying to be nice here, but listen to me. We have filled churches across the world with useless Christians. They're just useless. They're there. They don't do anything. They don't make any difference. They complain. They critique. They, everything's negative, And they just become useless. And God doesn't use them. And they're not being, they don't experience that blessing of God using them in their life. Always looking for a way to, to, to get out of something instead of into something. Always looking a way to avoid somebody who might ask them to do something or be something. And they're unfruitful and they become literally barren. 
in their spiritual life. Boy, it got real quiet on that, didn't it? I told you I was trying to be nice, all right? I really am. But I didn't write this, okay? But it's my responsibility to preach this. And it, 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 it's a caution for all of us. Don't, don't be that kind of person who becomes this place, it gets to that place of uselessness and gets to the place you really even forgot about the great power, the precious blood of the Lamb that purged you of your sins, he says. So the idea here, the motive and the method behind what we're talking about here is, is for all this is, is found in these verses about being fruitful and useful. You don't want to get to that place where you're unfruitful. He said, but you can get to the place where you're not living a life of stumbling. I know a lot of Christians, that's, that's the hallmark of their Christian life. They're always failing, always stumbling, you know. The, the, the goal here, he says, is to get you to the place where you're not living that stumbling kind of Christianity, just getting down the road, you know. You're always getting up from something, you know, and always messing up. All. That's not the Christian life that's described. Not going to be without failures, because as long as we're in the flesh, we're going to struggle, you know, in many ways. But it's not to the degree, I believe, nor to the depth that it was in the early years. We are growing and we're increasing every day. And he talks about, well, the method for this, how do you get to that place where that's all part of your life? And he says, so besides this. Now, the last week we dealt with the besides this and what the besides this was. And that's verse 5. For the besides this, you apply all diligence in your faith to supply virtue or moral excellence. All right. King James says, besides this. You know, I remember first time looking at that and, and reading, it says, he says, okay, besides this, besides what? Well, let's go back to the, what that is. That's the, that's the grace of Jesus. It's the virtue of Jesus. It's the abundant blessings of Jesus. It's those precious, magnificent, glorious promises of Jesus. All right. All that, you know, it's Jesus calling you. That's this. You say, well, man, what, what can you add to that? What can you add to the promises of God? Those glorious, magnificent, what can you, come on, Peter, are you out of your mind? <laughs> that's, that's everything. And he said, well, you can, you can add this. You can add a commitment. You can add, you can add a discipline in your life. You can add a, a commitment to all those glorious and precious and beautiful things that are part of your life. So he said, this is what gives you life. But just because we have life, it doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. It's not the end. We try to say we come to the altar. That's, that's the place of death. But the death is followed by a resurrection. So we've been raised. We're, we're new people in Jesus Christ. And now the goal here is to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing we try to tell people, even in our 201 class we do for spiritual maturity, we make it clear that spiritual growth is not automatic. I mean, even any more than physical growth. And when you were born, and you became a little baby. You had the ability. I mean, you got everything you need to be an adult. But hey, you're going to have to learn how to talk. You're going to have to learn how to walk. All right. You're going to have to learn how to change your own pants. I mean, we had grandbabies over the weekend. You know, Kathy had grandbabies without me there. That's, that's suicide alone. You know, having grandbabies. Some of y'all know what that grandbabies on your own, right? Especially when one of them's just now getting into that training part, and getting out of the diapers and stuff. Well, at 5 a.m. in the morning, we had an accident. That's what we call it at that age. My age is just being a little stupid. Get out of bed. <laughs> All right. And then we come back. That, and so Kathy, she goes in there and deals with the accident. Later on, after nap time, when I did get home after the conference, it just seems she does real good, except when it's time to go to bed. She had another accident. She comes running out of the room. Kathy's in the other room. She said, Poppy, do you smell something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I smell something. I smell something. What that smell like, Poppy? I said, I know what that is. So we go in the other room, and of course she's got those pull-down pants, you know, that we're working on and learning then, and, and they're just loaded up like a garbage truck. <laughs> Goodness gracious, you know, if you were here for the men conference, Malcolm Ellis talked about the deception of doo-doo. <laughs> you remember that session? Paul said, you know, I count all things as dung. He said, don't be deceived by the doo-doo. That was, he said, I tell you, you know, I got a fresh awakening of what Paul meant. 
and what the value of all my self-effort and self-righteousness is really worth. In fact, I called for help. <laughs> Kathy! <laughs> Do you smell something? <laughs> uh, it was a two-man job. <laughs> Amen? It was a two-man deal. Some, every parent knows exactly what I'm talking about, all right? Some of you are still dealing with it. Bless your hearts. So, the idea here behind all this is that you, you know, spiritual, physical growth is not automatic. You have to learn to walk. You have to learn to talk. Spiritual growth is equally not automatic. In fact, Paul made it clear to the Philippians in chapter 2 when he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He didn't say work for your salvation. Some people are trying to do that. That doesn't work. Salvation is a free gift of grace. But once you have been born again, you receive this grace, there's some commitments that have to be made in your walk, disciplines in your life that have to come. And this is what he's talking about. God's given you everything you need to live this life. And it's that to have spiritual life, spiritual victory, spiritual success. You can be that kind of Christian God wants you to be. You can experience the fullness of life. When Jesus said you might have life and have it more abundantly, that, that's not a joke. You can experience full life. And so here he says, hey, you want to experience God's giving you everything you need for life and godliness. But hey, you need to realize that with that, you, need, you have a responsibility. It's like God's done what he's going to do for you. Now you need to do something. And these are what we call faith works. This is, this is commitments to discipline and developing a life of, of spiritual maturity. And here's the way it breaks down. There's, there's some unique words that are, that are part of this passage as he, as he starts breaking it down to us. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. He, he writes it out. For this very reason, adding your diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, excellence, resolution, Christian energy, and exercising that virtue, he goes on to knowledge. Look at the, look at the words that we'll look at in, as we look at this few things out of this passage. He says, the, the first word he gets into, now that we've focused on God giving us everything we need for life and virtue and excellence, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give all diligence. Giving. Now, this word is a unique Greek word. It's the word is phero, and it's not the word always used in the scripture for giving. We translate to the English language. It is a word which really has to do with introducing something side by side. In other words, here's the gospel. Here's the promises of God. Here's the virtue of God, Jesus. Here's the glory of God, and here's the power of grace. We're making all that available to you. So you take that, and you bring that alongside and beside that, you do your part. And the word for giving here is literally to lead something into or to put something into something, to lead something, to carry something inward. You take all that, bring it inward. You, you do something. What's my first part? It's to give. Well, what am I doing? What am I giving? He says, you give all diligence. That's that Greek word. We get our word speed from. It's the word spude. All right. So the idea is, is something with, with, with earnestness, with, with, uh, with passion with carefulness, with intention, with haste, with zeal. He said, you do this. You take these things of God, and I want you to add these things from yourself to them. All these promises, all this glory, all this virtue, and then he lists these seven things that we're going to add to our faith, that we're responsible for. That if we're going to succeed, if we're not going to fail, these are things that, that are important that we should do. With all diligence, I apply them. I with diligent zeal and passion. And he uses this word, this adjective, with all diligence. I mean, everything you got is added to the thing. It, it's, it's, it speaks of zeal. In other words, you're going to approach this life as a child of God. You're going to approach your relationship to God with passion, with intention, with purpose. He said you, with all, and, and basically, I, I start to sound like Neil Jeffries here, aren't I? <laughs> if you were here, you understand that. It's with all the passion you have, you, 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 you attack it with, with the concept or the mindset that anything is possible now. Anything's possible now. Everything's possible now. Because why? I have the promises of God. And I can participate in the life of God. And I've got the virtue and the glory of Jesus Christ. I have all this available to me so I can attack this with a mindset it's all possible. I can be what God wants me to be. I can do what God wants me to do, no matter what it is. 
He said, that's what you need to do. He said, you come now, you embrace these principles, you embrace these truths, and here's what I want you to add to it. You give all diligence to add. There's a word which literally means in, the, in its language, it, it has to do with supplying something just generously. It is the word, if you can read that word up there in the Greek language, it's epikoriego. And it means to furnish something or contribute to something. It is the word, catch part of it, that koriego, that's where we get the word choreography from. It comes from the word which means chorus. It, 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 the musicians here know that when you have a song, if you're a songwriter, you add a chorus to the song. What does the chorus to the song do? It just illuminates the verses. It just emphasizes what's been communicated within the verses of the song. It amplifies what's been sung. And so we come back, I sing the verse, and now the chorus is just, it just adds to it, it contributes to it, it embellishes it, it gives clarity to what, what I'm singing about. When you have, a, when you have a, a choir, which is all part of this word as well, what does the choir do? They add fullness to the music. They add fullness to the message. They bring voices into it. That, that's what he said. You just, you just need to add. And the idea is, what am I adding? Well, it's me and Jesus. It's me and the Word. It's me and God's virtue. It's me and God's glory. It's me participating in the divine nature of God. So I need to be passionate about, hey, the partnership, the fellowship, the koinonia that I now have with God himself. I am his son. I belong to him. Hey, for lack of better terminology, hey, don't get no better than this. This is the ultimate. In fact, when they, where there was a chorus in the Greeks and this, where this, this language is given to us from to explain these things, the choreographer or the choir director at this point, they were hired by the states to have developed these choirs and they were responsible for giving the choir everything it needed to be successful. Basically, they paid the expenses for the training, they provided the support, they supplied what would be needed. So what do we get from that? What we're saying here is that it's my responsibility to supply, to add my voice, to be in chorus with what God's doing in his word and his glory and his zeal. It's my part of adding to it and say, hey, uh, I, this is the presence, grace, the beauty, the glory, the promises of God are available. I'm getting in now and I'm part of this and I'm bringing it into my life. I'm embracing it with a passion in my life and I'm going to be what God's called me to be. And it's like, as you walk through this passage, it's like, it, it's like a, a tree that's just blooming out. In the roots, you have Jesus. In the, in the, in the trunk, in the roots, you have the promises of God's word. You, you, it's like the vine where he says, abide in me. He supplies everything through the, through the trunk. And, and what adds to the trunk here is, I've made a commitment. I'm now part of this. It's adding to my faith, my relationship with Jesus. It's like this, the grace here, it flows into the plant and, 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 and the way that a, a branch relates to the trunk and the twigs on the branch relate to the, to the, to, to the branch, it just leaves out. It's, it's like the, the fruit of the Spirit now flows out of these things. It, it's, it's, it's the qualities that grow out of our life, the fruit of the Spirit is, because we have this now this, this relationship. So when you come to Christ, young or old, it's not enough to let to do what the popular saying, well, just let go and let God. No, that's not enough. He says, you make every effort to bring all this that, you, that, that I'm telling you about alongside. In other words, the Father and the child of God, we're in this together. And praise God for that because without him, he said, you can't do anything. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything. I think that's the way some people say, well, Bible, Jesus, I can't do anything. So I can't do anything anyway. I just let Jesus do it all. You got your part. You want to succeed? You want to be that person who's not useless? You want to be that person who's fruitful? Then there's responsibility to you to have with all diligence, give all diligence to add to your faith, your Christian walk, your Christian life, your Christian commitment, your relationship to Jesus Christ. That, that word faith is from that root word where you get the, the faith, refers to the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the hope of Jesus Christ. Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith. That's that word faith. Pistis, that's the word where all this comes from. We're saying you've got faith now in Jesus Christ, a true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to, you take that and you bring it into your heart and you bring it into your life and with all diligence, you add this to your faith. And he mentions these characteristics. This is what I want you to, let me put it this way. This way you nurture your faith. 
This is the way you, you feed your spiritual life. This is the way you, you feed and discipline your life so that you can grow and be fruitful, not be barren, be useful, have God do something in your life. So what we're going to do, I'm going to wrap up this sermon with this first of these seven ver uh, uh, qualities and characteristics. What do we add to our faith in the first of this list? He says, I want you to add to your faith virtue. Verse 3 makes it clear that according, you know, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that's our faith in Jesus Christ, the knowledge of him, he's called us to glory, and he's called us to virtue. This is what God's called us to, he says. Verse 3, it's not just something he wants us to add to it. It says, this is what I'm calling to. I'm calling you to virtue. It's the Greek word, erite, and it, it's, the, it's a word that many times has it, uh, the, the idea behind it of manliness. It, but it's not just gender related. It, it deals with fortitude, all right? That's, that's quality that man and women both need, spiritual fortitude. You know, spiritual, spiritual strength, spiritual boldness, spiritual courage, spiritual power, strength for living, strength for life. The, the, the context has to do with, well, sometimes some translations, like the New American Standard, uses, changes the word up unless it's to add to your faith, not virtue, use the word moral excellence. But that's still not good enough for what this word means. In fact, this has been a word which has intrigued me a long, 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 long time in Scripture. In fact, years ago, I wrote a book called Love, Lust, and Romance, How to Know It's Real. And I deal in one chapter with this issue of what virtue is. Because I think if we just say, well, it's moral excellence, I think we miss it completely because it goes much higher and much deeper than it. It gets to the idea of the strength for your life, the power to live a godly life. You know, it, what comes out of a heart that's virtuous is, is a unique power. It's a unique strength that God gives. A good Old Testament character of this is David. If you follow the description of David in the passage where they're having the battle with Goliath, it says David shows up to the front scene, the front, the front lines there. For 40 days, the army of Israel has been camped out against the, the, you know, the, the, the people of Goliath, the Philistines. They're down in the valley. Goliath's out there every day for 40 days. He gets up, puts on his armor, walks out there and challenges the army of God. The Bible tells the children of Israel are in battle array. In other words, they got up themselves. They put on their armor. They got their weapons ready. They did their war chants. They did their war talk. They got up around. They got up on the mountain. They're ready for fight. And they're all talking about fight. Everybody talking fight, singing fight, thinking fight until Goliath comes out. And there's no manliness in the army of Israel. There's no heroism. There's no strength. They just cower in the presence of Goliath. And it says, then David shows up. What's going on, guys? Well, it's just God down there. Forty days he's been coming up here. We ain't got to war yet. We've been up here a month and a half almost. We ain't fought anybody. <laughs> well, why not? Well, he's down there and he's, he's threatening us. Well, what's he saying? You, you, you can whip me. Send somebody out here whip me. You send me your champion and I'll whip him. And if I whip him and you serve us, if you whip us and you whip me, then you will serve you. And David says, I'll do that. But you follow the description of David said he was a young man with a ruddy face. What does that mean? It had to do with the, the element of innocence. If you look at David's life prior to this, and the way you can get a, a good handle on David's life prior to this, it gives little insights, but also those early psalms of his as a young man. When he's talking about integrity and purity of heart, when he's talking about how shall a young man cleanse his ways, you know, by taking heed to thy word. You see all these verses in there talk about the pathway to victory, the pathway to purity, the pathway to, to having a clear mind, a clear conscience, and having a heart that's not been defiled by the world. All that's a part of his life. And he shows up with a, with a spirit of heroism. I mean, just, you know, he's the hero. Nobody knows it. I don't know if he even knows it yet. But there's this unction about him that says, he's taunting the armies of the living God. You know, there's something about him that's offended by that. You know, he's not worried about his own reputation. Somebody, you know, he can't talk dirty about my God <laughs> or the armies of the people of my God. And we know the story he goes and he heroically wins that battle, chops off Goliath's head. <laughs> Where does that come from? Uh, let me give you a, a, what I call the Joe Arms definition. Y'all all have that dictionary in your house, don't you? The Joe Arms, uh, uh, Encyclopedia of Biblical Words. First of all, we said this word is, is that Greek word for erite, which has to do with moral excellence. But here, after, this is a lot of studies gone into this definition, all right? It simply says, it is the strength of life, the strength to live life that comes from innocence, 
integrity, a clear conscience, and character. That's the best I can say, and it's even deeper than that. But if I say, you know, what's important to me is a clear conscience. Why do I have a clear conscience? I, get, I, I stay up to date with the Lord. If there's something in my heart, it doesn't stay in my heart. If there's something in my life, it doesn't stay in my life. I guard my mind while I let it come in. I guard my eyes from the things that, that I know I'm not supposed to go. And that's hard to do in the world we live in. Because it might be primetime family hour, what used to be on TV, you know, from 7 to 9 o'clock. And you got every other commercial being Victoria's Secret or something like that. You know, which is just open, blatant pornography. All right? So there's a battle here for me or for you or for any of us, male or female, to stay clean and to stay, have a clear conscience and to stay morally pure because we're, we're constantly surrounded with this in the culture that we live in, such immorality and, and ungodliness. I told the men you know, about that one of the past presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention got up and, to, and there's 5,000 people gathered there and he got up and said, you know, he said, it's, it's any more going to church? He said, it's kind of going down to Popeye's chicken. It's all breasts, legs, and thighs. At church. He said, guys, I want you to realize moral purity is important. Modesty is important. Because if you're immodest or you're immoral, then not only it might, you say, well, it's not, well, I can dress like that, bother me. It bothers somebody else. You know, the Bible says we, we, we care for one another, we guard one another, we help one another, we minister to one another. We don't want to cause each other to stumble. So the, the last thing I need to do is cause you to cause me to stumble, but I don't need to cause you to stumble, but I also don't need to be responsible for making myself stumble. So what I'm going to have on my phone, what I'm going to have on my mobile devices, my iPads, my laptop, my Surface Pro, there's going to be filters. There's going to be things like at least I can stop from coming. I make those decisions. And say, I want to be morally pure. If you follow the New Testament through alone, and it's in the Old Testament as well, it seems that almost in every situation, whether it's Peter or Paul or the Lord Jesus even, when he deals with this issue of your faith and your commitment to God, the next step in your walk with God is always to deal with this issue of morality. Having a standard that's high, having a code that's high, that I'm not going to violate this. I'm not going to go that place. I'm not going to watch that thing. I'm not going to do that thing. But brother Joe, you know, everybody else in the world is doing it. Jesus said, he answers that question. Well, he said everybody else is going to hell. There's a broad road with many people on it. Where are they headed? Destruction, all right. There's a narrow road, not many people on it. Where are they going? I'm going that way. How about you? And the way to do that successfully is once you come to Jesus Christ, make sure your heart and your mind and the actions of your heart and mind and eyes and life are pure. That there be moral integrity and character and purity that's a part of your life. John MacArthur gave this, this illustration or this definition of this word. He wrote it like this. It is, this term, arete, was such a lofty term that it was used for moral heroism viewed as the divinely endowed ability to exceed, to excel in heroic and courageous deeds. It came to encompass the most astound, astounding quality, outstanding quality in someone's life or the proper and excellent fulfillment of a task or duty. In other words, when I get saved, the first thing I start working on is a pure heart. A pure heart. Get your heart pure. Get your mind pure. If you study the Old Testament, it's the same thing. And immorality, you see, begins to just, as you, as you re, begins to sap you of your spiritual life and your strength. The Bible says in 1 Peter, you're a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you might do what? You can proclaim the excellencies. And that's the word virtues. We're going to declare the virtue. God's virtues are noble, honorable, pure, right? His thoughts to us are pure and honorable and noble. We have that same kind of our life that, you know, that we can... We can realize that he's called us to virtue and we're to demonstrate virtue like light in the world. Solomon's talking to his sons and every father in here that has sons and grandsons need to take their, their, their sons through Proverbs 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 because it lays out clearly. Now, I didn't have a father who did this with me, but I had a mother who did this with me. She told me the importance of these passages. In Proverbs 5, he's telling about the young man who, who gets involved on, on the streets with, with, a, with, a, with an immoral woman. You know? 
He said, don't give, don't give your, don't give your honor. You know, your virtue is what he's talking about unto others and, and, and your years and, and unto the cruel. He said, because you, you won't last that way. He said, he said, strangers will be filled with your wealth. Your labors are, it will be in the house of a stranger. You'll mourn at the last when your flesh and your body are consumed. He said, my son, do not go in the way of that adulterous woman. Don't go in the way of the immoral woman. But man, we make movies about young boys and college kids and high school kids getting involved in immorality. We sell tickets by the millions of dollars to these kind of movies. They're all popular. They all just have to be seen. We, we give our kids money to go to the theater and watch movies like that. That's the dream of every young boy. I'm going to find this older woman, this virgin, you know, and she's, man, Proverbs 7, and she comes out on the street and grabs him by the collar and she entices him. And she says, hey, baby, she's got, says it's smooth lips. Honey's dripping from her mouth. She smells good. She looks good. She's showing everything that's available. She's telling him, my husband's gone. Come to the house with me. And in fact, Proverbs, Psalms, when you read in Proverbs there, Solomon's talking to his son. He says, he said, I was looking out the window. He, said, he was giving him a real demonstration, a real life story. He said, and I watched the naive young man go into that woman's house. And I saw him. He said, and he doesn't know, my son, that he's entering in like a bird into a trap that's going to kill him. He's going to be snared in the end. And he's going to be exposed for what he's done. And her husband's going to find out. And it's going to cost him everything to get out of this deal. It's going to be a bad deal. And there it is in black and white, but so many men ignore it. You know, and it cost them everything. Well, they say love is grand, divorce is 100 grand. <laughs> and, and, and their life is ruined. But it's not just those who are married. It's the single. It's, it, this is the biggest trap you can fall into as a Christian. Proverbs 7 deals with it. It said many strong were slain by her. Proverbs 6 deals with it as well. By the means of a horse woman, a man is reduced to just a piece of bread. In Proverbs 6, 32, it will destroy your soul. What's he talking about? If you choose the path that's not virtuous, if you choose the path of moral impurity. Samson's a great picture of this. Samson, remember, he's called to be a judge of God. God is on his life. God's demonstrating through Samson's life with spiritual power and integrity. But Samson had a problem. He liked girls. Now, there's nothing wrong with liking girls. I prefer you guys to like girls and guys. All right? That is a problem in the world today. But he went beyond the boundaries. He stepped over the lines. The Bible calls that transgressing. You step over the lines that separate us from the will of God versus our own will with decency and indecency. And he went after women. And it just wasn't women. The Bible says he liked whorish women. All right, now there's other terminologies for that day. I don't want to say them for you. You know what they are. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that they were paid employees. All right. They were just women whose desires were out of control and used what they had as a power over men and used what they had to destroy your life. I told you what my mom told me when I was 18 years old leaving home. She sat me down the day I was leaving the house. She said, I have one last thing to say to you. Yes, ma'am, you better sit down and listen. Three things you're going to face out there, Joe, they're going to be some of the biggest problems you'll face in life. Drugs and alcohol, that's one. Gambling, two. And three, women. And I was thinking, oh, we we'll hope so. <laughs> Stupid kid. <laughs> I tell you, you, moms, you know your boys can be dumb as dirt, right? Amen. When it comes to these issues, all right? She said, by the way, which one do you think is going to be your biggest problem? I already had one of them. Well, drugs and alcohol. That's not going to be your biggest face, biggest problem you're going to face. That can destroy your life. But I tell you what's going to destroy your life faster than anything else is the wrong woman. It didn't come from a man, ladies, by the way. It came from a woman, all right, who knows the power that a woman can have and the power that God gave a woman to influence. But unfortunately, many, many women use that power in an unholy and an unrighteous way when they could use that power of influence that God's given them in such a dynamic way. That's why the Bible says, who can find a... Use that word. There it is. A virtuous woman. What do you need, guys, to have a virtuous life? It helps to have a virtuous woman. All right? How do you find them? You can pick them out of the crowd. 
You can, you can tell by looking. I mean, I saw my wife first time I ever saw her. I said, that's a virtuous girl. I didn't know what the words were. I was lost as goose in a snowstorm. But man, she just emanated something. I didn't know it was Jesus. It was life. Isn't that what you want for your daughters? Isn't that what you want for your sons? Isn't that what we want for our lives? Because those people, those are the people who do the heroic. Those are the people who do the incredible. Those are the people who achieve to the highest measures of real living, not just what the world calls success and what the world calls life. So what are we going to do? We're going to have courage. We're going to have resolution. We're going to have fortitude. We're going to have strength. And we're going to have a supernatural life because we choose to be virtuous people. And you know, there's another place where the word virtue is used in the English language, but it doesn't come from this word, arte. It comes from the word dunamis. We know what that word is. That's that word where dynamite comes from. But the way it was used in such a way that we're trying to portray it in the language of Scripture to say, hey, real power is going to come from having a virtuous life. What Paul tell the young Timothy, who's in the ministry, a young man, flee youthful lust, follow righteousness, faith, charity, and peace with all those people who call out of the Lord out of a pure heart. I shared with our man at the conference that our man, a man's morality will dictate his philosophy. A man's morality will dictate his philosophy. In other words, if your moral standards are weak, then your religion is going to be real weak. Your spiritual life is going to be weak. And many times you'll just try to come back to the point, say, well, I'm living this way, and you'll try to find a way to justify it in Scripture, and you'll rewrite the Scriptures to get it to say what you want it to say. Jesus has given us a clear word on that. The Apostle Paul says, hey, in the last days it'll be like the wrath of God revealed against heaven from all men who would change the truth of God into a lie who would get the Bible to say what they want it to say. And you see that everywhere you go. People getting the Bible to say what they wanted to say. I told our men this week, you can find a church anywhere that'll go along with what you want to go along with. They're all over the place. I mean, if I want to live a life and, 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 and drink every week and smoke every week, I can find a pastor who does that. I can find a spiritual group of men, so-called spiritual group, and they do that. And we'll all sit around and have Bible study and drink Budweiser's together and smoke our Marlboro's. God's good, amen. That's good. Amen. Well, Brother Joe, you know, you know, my pastor does it. Deacon Bob does it. I'm not following Deacon Bob. I'm not following my pastor. I'm following Jesus. What's he got going on? And then comes that ignorant excuse, which displays the depth of their stupidity. Excuse me. Which is, oh, we're under grace. Yeah, tell me how that stands up and you get to the Bema seat. And God's called us to live holy lives and blameless lives. You see, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking. It doesn't say anything about a lot of things, but the principles are all through there, aren't they? Anything that's going to defile my testimony, anything that's going to defile my body, anything that's going to defile my walk, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Hello. You're not clear, just read the side of the pack. The Surgeon General has said, this will kill you. <laughs> that's pretty clear anymore, amen? <laughs> so what do we do? I'm going to make some decisions. I'm going to take all these blessings of God, all this virtue, all these glory, all these precious promises that says I can participate in the very life of God. I'm going to take that and I'm going to bring it in and I'm going to add to it moral purity. And now it's going, it's like adding gasoline to the fire, you know, and <clears throat> life begins. Victory comes. You're fruitful. You're not useless. You're enjoying life. And now as a result, of this, there's this resolution in your life. There's fortitude in your life. There's strength in your life. All is a result of that. And you're moving forward. God's given us these promises. So how do I make these moral decisions in my life? Because everybody has a different moral compass, don't they? Well, Brother Joe, I just don't think homosexuality is wrong. Why do they feel that way? Because their morality dictates their philosophy. Because they're involved in homosexuality usually. I don't think adultery is wrong. One man can't love one woman for their whole life. How stupid is that? It was, who was a, the Alaskan senator 15, 20 years ago that tried to pass an amendment to the Constitution that made marriages uh, only, you know, they wanted a certificate that was a seven-year certificate. In other words, you can get married for seven years and it expires, you have to renew it. I mean, that's going to mess up my, my vows that I do at the wedding for sure. I, Joe, pledge to you, Kathy, to love, honor, cherish, and obey you for seven years. You know? Yeah. How's that going to work? 
the ignorance of, of, of our mindset, but that's the way we approach. And we sound stupid, but that's the way people approach life. They say it's just not possible. I'm going to tell you one thing. Bless God, it is possible through Jesus, through his word. If you'll add some virtue, some moral excellence, some character, some integrity to your life, it'll change your life. I love this passage, and I'll close with this. Did I already say that? I closed with something a while ago. I'll just add it to it. <laughs> Paul said, I'm closing with this. Finally, my brother went on for four more chapters. So <laughs> this is it. The Lord showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, and with a plumb line in his hand, the Lord said unto me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Obviously, that's three times he's already told him what it was. <laughs> and the, said, the Lord, said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not again pass them by any more. Now, most of you that are in construction know what a plumb line is. When you build something, you're going to have a building, you want to erect a wall, you need a plumb line. Now, all a plumb line is, is just a, it's, a, it's a tool that shows you if something is perpendicularly correct and right. It's not leaning this way or that way or this way or that way, all right? So you hang a plumb line. I, I, I've made plumb lines at home. You can take a rock and a piece of cloth string and hold it up. Stand on a ladder, and now you've got a straight line. Bring the wall up. Does it match a straight line? Gravity pulls it down perfectly and centers it. If I don't do that and the wall's like this, it's not going to be long before the whole thing's going to collapse. If it's like this, you know, you don't have to be an engineer, right, to figure this out. <laughs> it's not going to hold constructurally. It's not going to hold. It's just not going to last. So God says, I have this plumb line, and I'm going to build this wall. He says, it's a wall built by a plumb line. What's that mean? It's the right wall. It's correct. Now, what is God's plumb line? He's given to us in this New Testament two. One, the Word of God the written word of God, and two, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the living plumb line. That's the standard we go by. I know it sounds old-fashioned, but when faced with a problem young people, what do you do? What does the Bible say? Is it reliable? Absolutely. It's eternal. It's God's word. You can't get more reliable than God. He's the eternal faithful God, the eternal true God. So I choose to live by... I know it's old-fashioned. What's the Bible teach? What's God's Word say? What's God's Word say about that? What's God's Word say about how I look? What's God's Word say about what I eat? What's God's Word say? I mean, those are good questions to ask. What I put in my body, what I do with my life, what are my conditions, who I marry, who I'm going to need to date, who you're going to, you know, where you're going to work. But God's Word has a lot to say about those things. In fact, where I'm, if I'm making a choice and it interferes with what God wants in my life, I don't need to make that choice. Amen? That's the plumb line. So we close the message today, you know, to answer a question that was asked back in the 80s. And it's the same question being asked today by many people. If we face another election similar to those in the 80s, when it was asked, does morality matter? Does it matter? The answer is absolutely yes. Because out of my moral standards and out of my moral commitments, you know, come power for making the right decisions. The ability to see what the right decision is. The ability to comprehend how to move forward, to make them do and, ex and excel in making the right decision. I mean, how many of you would still be sitting here and come to church next week and say, you know, guys, I made a decision. I love Kathy. But you know, I met the cutest little girl over the weekend. I mean, she's a doll. She's fascinating. She knows the Bible. Got sweetest blue eyes. She is something. Now, you know as well as I do, I probably wouldn't get out of the building alive <laughs> with Kathy sitting this close to me. <laughs> but what would you think about that? Or are his standards? And so I've decided that what the Bible talks about, that one man, one woman kind of thing, this is 2016. That doesn't mean that anymore. You know, we need to embrace what we call open theism. And open theism means that God's still changing his mind about stuff. That the word of God isn't settled. So we can add to it. Well, just read your Bible and see what it says about that. <laughs> so we can, we can just do whatever we want to do. I'm okay. You're okay. Now, there might be some who'd say, woohoo, me too. <laughs> But I would think 95% of you 
would leave and you wouldn't be here next Sunday. And I would hope so. Or you would have the courage to hang me out back <laughs> and not tell anybody. <laughs> oh, Pastor Joe, we don't know what happened to him. <laughs> a little hump of grass out there somewhere in the back. I don't know what that is. Flyers are going real good over that area. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Truth matters. And our commitment to truth matters. And out of your commitment to truth will come character and integrity and strength for living your life. God's good and his good to his people is what this passage is saying. So get in on it. Add to your faith. Don't be content to just get saved. Go on. Get deeper. Go further. Climb higher. Dive deeper in your walk with God. Like Neil, uh, uh, Neil Jeffrey said, it is a passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ. See what God does in your life. This morning, let's just stand with our heads bowed. Open our hearts to the Lord Jesus. God said something he said to you.